Pop Culture. Our guest on Classic Pop Culture, along with his band, The Legendary Association, has sold more than 70 million records, has six gold records, a double platinum album, seven Grammy nominations, one Golden Globe nomination, seven top 40 hits, and three of their songs are listed as the most played BMI licensed songs of the 20th century, Never My Love, Cherish, and Wendy. And there are plenty of firsts, which we'll get to during our conversation. He's written a brilliant new book called Along Comes the Association, Beyond Folk Rock and Three-Piece Suits. It's my pleasure and my honor as a first-generation association fan to welcome Mr. Russ Jaguer. Russ, this is Steve. Thank you so much for making time out of your busy schedule. Oh, my pleasure, guy. It's good to be with you, Steve. Well, first of all, um, congratulations to you and your co-writer, Ashley Wren Collins, on this brilliant book. You've got to be happy. It took years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just like it how I mean she she actually told me uh when we were going for a deal she said now it'll take a year to a year and a half to get a deal and I'm glad she told me because I would have exploded. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it's almost like making a movie, they say, sitting around and waiting. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But a lot of a lot of work went into this book, a lot of research. It it really shows. You know, this is one of those books that as I was reading it, I, I found myself, I kept looking at the end, how many pages are left, because I never wanted it to end. And as it was getting more and more towards the end, I went, ah, no, because you want it to go on forever. You, you're so open, and you tell so many wonderful stories. Cool. Uh, it's appreciated that you were so open with things. Um, what I thought was... well. Well, during our conversation, yeah. we're going to mention each member of the association. So do you mind if I just go down the list and you can give me a brief... Not at all. Each? Okay? Sure. All right. So um, first, just a real brief, your your assessment of your fellow comrades of the uh, six-headed monster, as I believe um, Ted Bluchel called the association. <laughs> right? uh, Jules, Jules Alexander. What are your thoughts? Jules was uh, was one of the first guys I met. I met him. I met Terry first. Terry was managing a club uh, in the in the Empire, and Jules had just gotten out of the service. I met Jules when we met. We were like we, like we had known each other all our lives. It was great. I play. He was the first guy I played with. Mm -hmm. uh, one night, one night uh, the opening act was late. And Bob Stain, the guy who managed the Ice House, asked me if I'd do a set, which I felt greatly honored to do. And I said, Jules, do you want to play bass? He said, yeah. There was always a bass in the dressing room. So we tuned it up. And the, that was the first time we played together, was <laughs> right then. So I did a few tunes. And, uh, and you knew pretty much from the beginning. He, well, he was a great guitarist. He was just one of those people that just has the touch. You know, he, there's stories about him playing in the in the book. Yeah. He's just fabulous and a hell of a guy. Nice guy too. You mentioned Terry. Terry Kirkman. Uh, Terry was uh, when I met Terry. He was managing a club called the Meeting Place, and he comes to the Ice House to see the acts to see if there's an act that he could. Uh, Bring over to the meeting place, and he all—he always had instruments with him. He always had pockets full of harmonica or uh, a recorder in his belt. A recorder is a wooden uh, flute, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he was ready to play it. And he loved to play. He loved and he would play it at any. At you know, it didn't take much prodding to get him to go. And he was uh, always a writer and a player and a. Great guy. He's uh, he was uh, he had played with Frank Zappa in his youth. And the mothers. And, and the mothers. In fact, uh, during when the association first started, during one of the early rehearsals, he invited uh, Frank to come see the band, and uh, Frank came in. Frank was a very sweet guy. He was just falling into mothers. Mm -hmm. 
what did Frank think of you guys? Well, he loved the band. He actually pulled Jules aside later, and he said, "Would Jules, would you and Russ be interested in joining my band, The Mothers of Invention, that I'm forming?" And Jules said, "Well, I think we we put a lot into this guy. I think we're doing this." And Jules didn't even tell me till a couple of months later, <laughs> but he was right. We had put a lot of work into the, into the uh, yes. the band. So. But uh, I was felt greatly honored. Zappa was just a real very sweet guy. Mm-hmm. That's nice to hear. Um, gone way too soon, Brian Cole. Uh, Brian Cole was a brilliant young man. Uh, he was also the only guy who was involved in drugs and needles, and uh, yeah. it was real unfortunate that he died. It was uh, he died speedball. He was doing cocaine and then heroin, cocaine and heroin, and. But he was a very young man, a um, good bass player, and good bass player. You know, it was, it was, it, I was crushed. I was the first guy in the, uh, uh, when he passed, his lady, uh, Linda, called me. Mm. And uh, I was the first over there, over to his house before the police or the, any of the other band members were there. He's, from your book, he seemed like a lovable, wise guy. Is that a good description? <laughs> He yeah he he was a, I really liked it I liked Brian but he he, yeah. he would push your buttons to really aggravate you he mm. he he enjoyed aggravating people it was uh, funny <laughs> well what's, what's nice is his son Jordan is now a member of the association correct yeah yeah, yeah. his son that's nice yeah yeah it is nice Jordan's a great player and a great nice guy real sweet guy uh, drums Ted Blushell Ted Blushell is an excellent human uh, excellent drummer. Excellent singer, excellent writer. Uh, he, uh, when we first started, I I had always thought of the Beach Boys as a band for rich white kids, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so Ted said, "No, no, no, listen." And he took me to his room. We were four of us lived in a group house. Me and uh, Jim and Ted. And let's see, me and Jimmy, Terry and Jules all lived in one. So Ted took me into his room and played me some uh, some Beach Boys, you know, some stuff that wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't about cars and cruising to drive in. Right. And it changed my mind. Actually, it changed my mind right then. Yeah. Yeah, I before realized that, what. Before, before that, you thought they were yeah. a one trick pony, I guess, huh? Beach Boys. Well, I just thought they did. Yeah, you know, I, I it was cars and chocolate balls. You know, yeah. not exactly my my realm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he changed that. He gave me. I started thinking them as more of an artistic group. Mm-hmm. Jim Yester. Jim was wonderful. He was just out of the. Jim was the last guy we added. Um, we had one guy in the band who was uh, who really didn't get along with the other guys too well, mm-hmm. especially me. <laughs> so, get to that, so, anyway, what, <laughs> so Ted and I saw Jim at the uh, Ice House Hoot on on mo- Sunday night, and then again we saw him on Monday night at the Troubadour Hoot. So anyway, he um, we talked. We got a hold of him. And told him to come by this one day so the other guys could hear him. And he, this one day that, uh, the, this other guy that didn't get along with everybody, a day that he was out doing errands, we had Jim come by and Jim just blew the other guy's minds. And I, and I remember asking him, I said, do you sing as high as your brother? He says, I have actually several notes on my brother. <laughs> and we wow. were filled with that. His brother was Jerry Esther, who was a noted tenor. Mm-hmm. He was one of the MFQ, Modern Folk Quartet which was, uh, at the time, everybody's favorite quartet. I mm-hmm. mean, they just sang exquisitely and were devastatingly handsome. They were a great group. So Jim, uh, so he said, Jim, uh, to come back in two days, that the other guy would be fired and he would uh, be in the group. Yeah. And luckily, he wore the same size suit. <laughs> by, the way, guys, that was, by the way, the finances are starting to fall into place. So, so you thought. <laughs> Say that again. I said he wore the same size suit, so right away the finances were falling into place. Oh yeah, yeah, it was great. I thought it was, I thought it was definitely a sign. 
But Jim uh, was a was a, just had a, there was a song out at the time. One of the lines of the song was "Just out of the army and looking for his son." I think it was uh, anyway, but but that's what Jim was. You know, Jim was a great singer, great writer, good player, good uh, great still, human being. Still with the band, you know. Yeah, so he joined the band, mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately uh, succumbed to cancer in 2014. The great Larry Ramos. Yeah, Larry. Uh, Larry replaced uh, Jules. Left much to everyone's chagrin. No one wanted Jules to leave, but he he felt the need to go to India. And uh, my my opinion was India will still be there in a couple of years. Yeah, really. <laughs> you know, can yeah, meditate, meditate any time, right? Well, he he was he was meditating. He was already yeah. a very spiritual guy. The whole band was really into. Uh, Things of a non-physical nature, metaphysical. Yeah, Everybody you know, was into the metaphysics. Plus, anyway, uh, he left, and uh, we brought uh, Larry in. Larry was an excellent player, excellent player. Um, fit right into the group. He the only thing was he he really liked the blues, and we don't do the blues. We had one rule in the band when it concerned music and that was no whining. Uh, okay, <laughs> and the blues whine too much. <laughs> so he, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's tough enough so for anyway. six individuals to get no whining, let alone sing about it. Yeah, 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 it's true. So I, in the book, I read something very, very nice about you, and it says a lot about your character. When when Larry had first joined the group, um, you were hand were going to handle the lead vocals on Wendy, and you yeah. felt to bring him to do co lead with you to. Immediately well, I was saying it, yeah. While I was saying the lead in the studio, I thought, if you, Larry's doing the band. And I, it just occurred to me that this song was really going to be very large in Chicago, the Windy City. Mm -hmm. you know, so I thought, well, it would be perfect if, if, if he sang it with me. So I, I that, said, I said right on the mic, I said, why don't we have Larry come in and sing with me? He's, new, he's the newest member of the band, and it'll establish him right off. Now, that's a very uh, ex definition example of a team player, you. How unselfish. That was a really good move. Well, I didn't actually even think of it. I, it was just, it just seemed the thing to do. It seemed to, seemed to be a good move to me. Mm, well, it was a good move. Good for you. Now, well, I had also... Uh, the uh, never my love it was originally me and Larry, me and uh, Terry. They wanted to do it like a cherry because we sang lead on cherish, right? And I thought I had a lot of leads on the on that album. I and I suggested that we put Larry in with Terry and have him sing again for the same reason because he's the newest guy in the band and it gives him established. You know? Yeah, I think as a matter of fact, Russ, on your first album and and then along comes the association. You had seven. Of the 12 songs as lead singer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was fun. It yeah, was, that great was great fun. Great. You know, I loved how in the book, and once again, everybody, the name of the book is Along Comes the Association, Beyond Folk Rock and Three-Piece Suits. And you can get it at Way all beyond. <laughs> <laughs> Way beyond. This is, as we'll see as we're talking here, you can get it, everybody, at the usual places, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble. I do want to mention that you can get signed copies at Book Soup. Dot com. Um, hurry up, though, you know, while, while supply lasts, but they'll mail it right out to you, booksoup.com and the other the usual, other usual suspects to getting books. You won't yep. get it down, everybody. And one of the great, th so many great things about the book, Russ, was that you were so open. Can we, um, I'd like to talk about a few things that went on during your touring days. And uh, yeah. some, some of them pretty pretty wild. So um, for us fans, uh, even hardcore fans, at the time, the association did appear to be six, clean cut, nicely mannered, six piece wearing, uh, three piece wearing guys. However, yeah. there are some very unassociation like incidents in the book that makes, makes it so, <laughs> makes you guys well, we so much, problem partiers. makes you guys <laughs> so cool. I'm thinking about one of the things is you guys played many gigs at Disneyland and Disney World. And yeah. can you tell us about there are certain places in the parks that you found to do something, if 
you know where I'm getting. Well, yeah, we uh, we smoke a little weed on the uh, thing that went above the fantasy land, the uh, the ride. <laughs> it, you know, and we smoke we smoke these little pipes with, with just one hit them, so it wouldn't permeate the air. And a couple of rides, we just <laughs> had noted uh, if they had ever found a studio, we would have been out of a job. Although we worked ev- before we had a record, we had worked every land to Disneyland. Wow! So uh, yeah, but 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 yeah, we had a couple places Mark put aside to uh, to smoke a little. So I have a feeling. <laughs> I was going to say I have a feeling, listeners. Next time you go to Disney World or Disneyland, go right to Fantasyland, find a place. <laughs> and you'll get yeah yeah I, I tell you what was funny was when we first had, had our hit along comes Mary uh, it, it was on the charts and one of the one of the security guards pulled our manager aside one day when he came to work he said I heard the guys have a hit on the charts and uh, it's about marijuana and our Dean Fredericks was our manager at the time. He said, well, I don't know about that. And he opened his briefcase and he pulled out a review of, of the uh, record. That it mentioned that it was, uh, Mer- Mount, uh, Mount, I think it was Marymount College, which was a Catholic school. It was their song of the year. <laughs> a long time yeah. <laughs> so he pointed that out to him and they couldn't say anything. He didn't say, yes, let us go on. You know, but that's, that's, it was very, it was very funny. That's one of the great debates. I mean, I, I think it's about marijuana, but I know. It's not I think it is too. I, I didn't write it, so I don't know. But I tell you, Jules played on the on the demo session for the record, mm-hmm. and he brought it back to the group house that night. Jules, Jules played bass on it, mm-hmm. and he put on put it on, he had it on an acetate. The acetate is like a. A record is good for maybe a dozen plays. You know, it's not high quality, but it, it's for uh, to show the record. So Jules put the record on the record player, and me and Jim were the only ones there. Went, holy moly, what a tune! And we didn't. Even, we just knew it was a great song. We just started. We wrote down the chords and what we thought the words were. Later, we got the real words, and we just started working on the tune. And then, when the next day, when the other guys arrived. We played it for them, and they had, every guy in the band had the same reaction. And we just started, it was it's the only tune we ever did that we never voted on. Mm. Everyone yeah. just just said, yeah. and obvious. we didn't really we didn't really think of what it was about. We just liked the words, and we liked the music. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was just a great song. It was I've never heard a song like it. Well, uh, n- nor did I. Um, but speaking of, more- and I'll tell you what's funny. Yeah. It was the B side of the record. Some guy, some disc jockey flipped it over. Wow! How, how and he gave a hit. You, you know, you hear, <laughs> you hear that every so often, don't you, Russ? That the B side. Oh yeah. Won. Yeah. Well, well, it was, uh, it, it was, uh, as they say, it had legs. Mm-hmm. Yes. You mentioned "Along Called Mary," uh, "Along Comes Mary," and a very important and I think a very telling part of the association history is that. You guys were chosen to open the legendary Monterey Pop Festival in '67. Now that's yeah, that's true. That's an important position, boy. Open the show. Well, the Monterey the Pop Festival was great fun for us because we were on the road so much. We were doing like 250, 300 concerts a year, so we were really working a lot. So we were traveling so fast, and sometimes we never even met the people that we were working with. Mm-hmm. So the Monterey Pop Festival, we stayed all three days and all three nights, and we opened the festival. So it was great for us. I know there's some footage of that on uh, on YouTube that I saw. You guys really kicked ass on that. That was oh yeah, we did very well. We were we were good. We were really a good band. I was very proud of the work we did. You know, it 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 must bother you that too too often you guys are. Tagged as a sunshine pop band. That couldn't be oh, any yeah, further. that couldn't really be bothered. Oh, uh, way off, way off. We did all kinds of music. We never did any one kind of music. And we were a, we were a really a good band. You know, so it, it bothers me when I read stuff like that. It, that's uh, that's think, people picking labels to use. I think you in your song catalog as avant-garde almost. I mean, you guys really did that. We did art, and we did it well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and that's what we did. 
We didn't. We weren't a sunshine pop band. We weren't a you know bubble gum. Nope. We were. We were. We were. We were artists that did our art, and we did it well. That's what we were, and that you know, it's hard to define what we were. It's hard for me to define what we mm-hmm. were, and I was it. Yeah, yeah, but it's very hard to define. It did. It, the only definition is artists doing art. Yeah, well you put. Know? Yes, well put. I, you know, the song for me, and I believe I saw you guys performing on the Smothers Brothers show. I know I saw you do it on TV, but when I heard "Requiem for the Masses," I said, "Oh these, yeah, these guys very, very. are cool," and they. Well, we use the expression now. They work out of the box, but they this is very a powerful heavy song. song. It's a heavy song. Yeah, very powerful. Uh, we uh, in the, when we were in the men, uh, Terry came to the group with the suggestion of combining a requiem mass with uh, there was a song called "Who Killed Davy Moore" that Bob Dylan wrote. That was yes. yeah. mm-hmm. based on the song "Who Killed Cock Robin." So we did it in the men. It was great. Eleven voices. It was great. So when the men broke up and said sort of fell by the wayside, I suggested to Terry that he take that concept and write a song and combine it with a regular mass. So uh, within about a year or two, he did. It was great. I mean, it was very moving. I, I, I either teared up or actually cried every time we did that song. To this day, I get chills. Literally, goosebumps yeah, yeah. come up. Yeah, it's... Wow. It, it's a, a, a it's just a hell of a piece of material, and, and that's Terry on the trumpet, right? Oh yeah, Terry yeah. on the uh, let's see, I'm trying, it's not it's not a trumpet. Not sli- uh, well, the brass instrument, whatever. I'm, yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to think of what it is, uh, whatever. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's Terry. Mm-hmm. Um, Pretty simple arrangement. <laughs> we had already recorded that once with a full orchestra. Mm. And uh, when we, this was before, we, and we ended up going with Bones, and Bones listened to it and said, "You yeah, know, just take it down, mm-hmm. get rid of all this stuff." Well, you know, I and think, so we. I think it works because it really brings out the feeling of that loneliness when when one is. Yeah, it does. It's a, it it really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yes, it does. Mm-hmm. It, 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 I think we did it just right. It was. Oh my! It, it is a, a classic, classic song. Yeah, it's a great one for yeah. sure. Um, I'm only bringing up this p- point about Larry Ramos because it, it figures into this next thing I want to talk to you about. Now he was he was a, he was a blend of Chinese and Spanish, and while I'm well, he was Filipino, Filipino, yeah. Filipino descent. Okay, my mistake. Yeah, so that's Chinese and Spanish. Yeah, yeah that's Filipino. While on tour in the '60s, he really faced a lot of racism. Um, oh yeah! You mentioned in the book <laughs> that some of you guys even resorted to carrying guns. That's how bad it was. Well, me uh, actually, we, all the guys in the band didn't even know we carried these guns. We never flashed them. They weren't carried for any macho reason. They were carried because it was a scary time, and if something went down, we were going to win. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, Jim Jim Yester in the band. When he read the book, said, "I didn't. I never knew you guys had were carrying guns, well, and I I carried a thirty. Yeah, until the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I I carried a thirty two automatic. Brian carried a forty five, and Jules carried a sub nose thirty eight. It was only for about two or six months, you know, and then we stopped carrying them. But uh, I remember one time we were at a party." And I, this was in the South, and the guy, a guy walked up to me, and we were all there. This is when Larry was in the van. The guy said, look at Larry. He said, that China boy with you? Oh, boy. And I just mm. looked at the guy in the eye. I said, yeah, he's my partner. Why? Yeah. And the guy just didn't say anything and just walked away. But that's. That's, That's what you up against, yeah. part of the reason why we carried the guns. Yeah, you know, I absolutely. mean, you never what knew. Shame, you just never knew. It was a weird. It was a weird time. Um, the door is at the Whiskey A Go Go. See, listeners, this is yeah, what, I, this is what's great about Russ's book, guys. I mean, he just he just hears so many super stories. What do you think of Jim Morrison? Well, I went. I, I just wanted to go out to hear uh, rock and roll bands, and they were new at the time. They were new at the time. The oh yeah, they, they hadn't had any hits or anything. They were just a band called The Doors, and I, I, 
uh, I was familiar with uh, the, the book Doors of Reception. So yes. anyway, I went to see the band and the, and the other bands were playing. I can't remember who they were, but they came on stage and uh, Jim Morrison could barely stand up. He was so drunk. So anyway, I just walked out. Within six months, they had a number one hit. Mm-hmm. You know, but you it was, uh, you I remember. I guess you weren't that impressed with his stage presentation anyway. Not that, not that night. Yeah. Yeah, I, I never saw him when he was sober, so I can't say. Yeah, I, he was just real drunk that night. You know. You mentioned in the book, uh, once again, everyone, it's called Along Comes the Association, Beyond Folk, way beyond <laughs> folk rock and three-piece yeah. suits by Russ Jaguar and his co-writer, Ashley Wren Collins. You mentioned that not many, not some of the group members weren't road hog, could, didn't take to the road well, but you certainly did. You liked the road. Well, I always wanted, this was uh, they, they had the fulfillment of a dream to me. I mean, I just want, always wanted to sing for a living. For many years, in fact, when I was working, when I worked at the Ice House, uh, I, I nothing terrified me more than standing in front of a mic with a guitar just singing. Mm-hmm. And so I figured I better get over it. So I did. During the two years I worked at the Ice House, I did the Ice House Hoot Nanny uh, once a once a month for two years, and I did the Troubadour Hoot Nanny once a month for two years, and I finally got over it, my fear. Mm. You know, but I knew I knew what I wanted to do, and I knew if I wanted to do it, I had to get over this. And the only way to get over something is do it. So I did. And that seems, at least from reading the book, that seems to be your mo, your personality. You're not afraid to confront or, or confront any of your fears. No, nah, not so far. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it may have been to your detriment to get with some of your uh, band members, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can be, I can be a mouthy. I mean, not, not just you. I mean, you put six guys together, six, six, six successful guys together. There's got to be some kind of friction. Oh yeah, there was friction out again. But overall, we were just we just concerned with doing good shows, and we did them. Mm-hmm. I mean. I, I graded our shows on a one to ten, mm-hmm. and with the lowest we ever did was a nine, and that was very rarely. And some of the shows were elevens and twelves. Mm, yeah, I listen. I, yeah, I've, 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 I unfortunately I didn't see the association in the sixties, but I've seen the association with you two years ago, and the, uh, the yeah. newer the newer uh, configuration. You guys are just so professional. Yet, you've got that sense of humor still within the band, and it, it's it's such an entertaining show. And I'm, like I said before, I'm so glad you added Requiem to the set list as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad, I'm glad they did too. We didn't we didn't do it for a few years, but they they added it several years ago, and I was so glad they did. I I still I haven't performed with the band since '13. I record I re. I retired from the band in uh, December of 2013. Can, can we tell, talk a bit about your health condition while you left the band? Well, uh, I thought I'd bring it up. <laughs> I was, well, my my lady died. Uh, Brian, Larry became real ill, and I just was smoking too much, and it just wasn't a good I time. Just, I, you know, the funny thing is, I thought I would really miss it. And I'll tell you, we've got so many thousands of shows, I really didn't miss it. Mm-hmm. I'm not to say that I didn't know, I loved every show we did. Yeah. But I didn't really miss doing it. You know, I, I think it's because we had done so many thousands of shows. Mm-hmm. Now, you still so, have a I hand mean, in, you still have a hand in the say, business end of it. Oh, yeah. I, I sign all the band checks. I do all the business for the band. I run the band, basically. That's uh, probably from, uh, one of the last things you'd be doing. If you think back of the '60s, right? That you, would yeah, yeah, I, I never thought of it, but uh, I'm still very proud of the band. Oh, the band sure. just Absolutely. did phenomenal work. Yeah, and they the, still work a lot. Yes. <laughs> you know? How many shows a year do you think you? Uh, well, this year has you'll do maybe a hundred, probably sixty or seventy. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, it's a lot of shows. Yeah, absolutely, it is. Uh, Nothing like the old days, but yeah. then the old days, I mean, a lot of the guys were co- complaining that we were on the road too much and it was killing them, mm-hmm. you know. You know so, and uh, for a lot of guys, it was too much, but for me, I just, 
I was just thrilled to be doing it. Yeah. We, uh, we're getting near the end here time-wise. Uh, there are a couple of other things I'd love to just mention, too. There were, were a few, uh, excuse my language, sons of bitches who ripped you guys off for money throughout your career. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> how, how did that, that must have destroyed you? Well, it all worked out, though. We, we, we got away from them, and then it should continue on. Doesn't it, does yeah. it still amaze you? I mean, you know, to me it does. I'm 66, and it still amazes me that there are people that are so ruthless to do things like that. I mean, I, maybe I'm too well, naive or idealistic. It's just the way people are, guys. You know, there's, there's just, it's just the way people are. Yeah. We're, we're, we're a side with a guy who, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> who's a friend of mine who said he was an, uh, a man, uh, an agent. And he was not. So the first in the first uh, six months, he got us like eleven dates. And I said to him, I said, the, the group can't work, live on eleven dates. It's, we're talking about five, six households here, you know. Yeah, ridiculous. And the guy says, his advice to me was, well, economize. So the next day, I went with the agency we're with now, which gets us sixty, seventy dates a year. Yeah, you mentioned the, book, yeah. the agency. Yeah. They, they, they have a lot of great artists, the agency you're with now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're Paradise tried, is a good tried and true. Paradise does good yeah. work. Um, last two things. I think it's interesting. I think the fans would love to hear the bit how Terry Kirkman said, if, uh, if you guys would have done this song, it may have changed the direction of the association. I'm talking about the band's decision not to record Jimmy Webb's MacArthur Park. How do you feel about that decision? Well, we honestly didn't, we never voted it down. It's just that it was shown to us as we were finishing an album. And our producer, Bones Howe, had, had Jimmy Webb come in and do the tune for us while we were recording. And so we were doing the finishing of the vocals. And we, everybody was impressed with the tune, but we, we were finishing doing this album. And we couldn't do it. And Bones said it couldn't be cut. And they, when they showed it to us, it was like 19 or 20, 21 minutes long. So we we, we never turned it down. We just said we couldn't do it right then. Mm-hmm. And Bone said it couldn't be cut. So we finished this album. Uh, we went on the road. We were on the road about two weeks, and we heard a recording of of, of the song uh, that was about seven minutes long. It was obviously someone had cut it. <laughs> you know, but... Uh, you know, I, I, I felt I really should tell the truth about what happened in the book because there were so many stories about how we turned it down and how we, we, we didn't turn it down. We weren't rude. We were impressed. Mm-hmm. But we just, we were finishing the album right then. Just, and we couldn't, I mean, we couldn't dump half the album. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. Would have been one side of, so, one side of the album. Full yeah, at least. Yeah, yes. If not the whole album, <laughs> yeah, you know, no, at least it had fine. <laughs> but anyway, it was. Uh, we like Jimmy Webb. We like Jimmy Webb tunes. You know, he's a uh, great writer. Now I'm I'm going to leave my listeners with with this. I'm going to just read something from the book, and listeners, if as if I I know you're going to order the book anyway, but here's something that'll really titillate you. It did it did me. In your book, Russ, you write, don't think I don't know you're holding out for some good gossip to fill in the sex part of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll equation. And I'll tell you, you you did it, you you mentioned some of your uh, companions in a very gentlemanly way, but you name names, and Mm -hmm. it's it's just so refreshing to read stuff like that and, and you spoke of <laughs> you know and, and, and well, I'm is, glad you like the guy I don't, I don't know I, maybe we should just keep it a keep it a secret until they read the book uh, unless you want to say something I don't but, read it. yeah that's exactly my <laughs> thing it's guys it's names that you know and uh one of them really surprised me russ and i'm not going to mention the name but uh not not that you weren't that i just didn't see her as that type of uh, rock and roll person but she wasn't. Yeah, right. Yes, exactly. We I just met as human beings. We just knew yeah. each other as human beings. Yeah, that, I, didn't know, yeah. I didn't know that she was what she was either. Well, for those of us who were lucky enough to grow up with the association's music as part of our lives, 
And for those of our listeners who are too young to have experienced their music first generation, it will be with us forever, making us think, sing along, and feel good about being alive. And that's where we owe a huge debt of gratitude to our guest, Russ Jaguer. Russ, thank you so much for this great time. I, I can't thank you enough for writing the book. And it's been a real, real pleasure speaking with you. Well, thanks, Stephen. I'm glad you're interested in it. I mean, this has been a great fun for me. Thank you. And, and stay safe and stay healthy. Yeah, of course. This is a very hard time. Yeah. All right, Russ. Be good, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.